This morning in our study of Genesis, we will be considering chapter 43. These are the words of God. Now the famine was severe in the land, and it came to pass when they had eaten up the grain which they had brought from Egypt, that their father said to them, Go back, buy us a little food. But Judah spoke to him, saying, The man solemnly warned us, saying, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you send our brother with us, we will go down and buy food. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. And Israel said, Why did you deal so wrongfully with me as to tell the man whether you had still another brother? But they said, The man pointedly asked us about ourselves and our family, saying, Is your father still alive? Have you another brother? And we told him according to these words. Could we possibly have known that he would say, Bring your brother down? Then Judah said to Israel his father, Send the lad with me, and we will arise and go, that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. I myself will be surety for him. From my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. For if we had not lingered, surely by now we would have returned this second time. And their father Israel said to them, If it must be so, then do this. Take some of the best fruits of the land in your vessels and carry down a present for the man a little balm, a little honey, spices and myrrh, pistachio nuts and almonds. Take double money in your hand and take it back in your hand also the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was an oversight. Take your brother also and arise. Go back to the man. And may God Almighty give you mercy before the man that he may release your other brother and Benjamin. If I am bereaved, I am bereaved. So the men took the present and Benjamin, and they took double money in their hand, and arose and went down to Egypt, and they stood before Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of his house, Take these men to my home, and slaughter an animal, and make ready, for these men will dine with me at noon. (coughs) Then the man did as Joseph ordered, and the man brought the men into Joseph's house. Now the men were afraid because they were brought into Joseph's house, and they said, It is because of the money which was returned in our sacks the first time that we were brought in, so that he can make a case against us and seize us to take us as slaves with our donkeys. When they drew near to the steward of Joseph's house, they talked with him at the door of the house and said, Oh, sir, we indeed came down the first time to buy food, But it happened when we came to the encampment that we opened our sacks, and there each man's money was in the mouth of his sack, our money in full weight. So we have brought it back in our hand, and we have brought down other money in our hands to buy food. We do not know who put our money in our sacks. But he said, Peace be with you, and do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. Then he brought Simeon out to them. So the man brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water. And they washed their feet, and he gave their donkeys feed. Then they made the present ready for Joseph's coming at noon, for they heard that they would eat bread there. And when Joseph came home, they brought him the present which was in their hand into the house and bowed down before him to the earth. Then he asked them about their well-being and said, Is your father well, the old man of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? And they answered, Your servant, our father, is in good health. He is still alive. And they bowed their heads down and prostrated themselves. Then he lifted his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your younger brother of whom you spoke to me? And he said, God be gracious to you, my son. Now his heart yearned for his brother, so Joseph made haste and sought somewhere to weep, and he went into his chamber and wept there. Then he washed his face and came out, 
And he restrained himself and said, Serve the bread. So they set him in a place by himself, and them by themselves, and the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves, because the Egyptians could not eat food with the Hebrews, for that is an abomination to the Egyptians. And they set before him the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth. And the men looked in astonishment at one another. Then he took servings to them from before him, but Benjamin's serving was five times as much as any of theirs. So they drank and were merry with him. Our gracious God and Father, we pray, open up, Lord, the, the meaning of these events, the things which you did so long ago through Joseph, your servant, that you might teach us today. Let us learn all the lessons you would have us learn and let us live as you would have us live. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we've been away from Genesis for a couple of weeks due to Palm Sunday and Easter. But if you remember the last time we saw what a vivid picture of Christ Joseph is. Because after all of his sufferings, just as Christ suffered, Joseph suffered, and he suffered wrongfully. It wasn't due to any of his sins. But now God has brought him out of all those sufferings and has exalted him to the right hand of Pharaoh, where he exercises power over all Egypt and even the surrounding nations because the famine is widespread and severe and Joseph is the only one with the bread of life. But this has resulted in the strange situation where the Gentile Egyptians have received Joseph and the truth God has revealed through him, and yet his own brothers have rejected him and the truth. But God is not done. He is going to bring the brothers to repentance and faith, and he's going to use Joseph to do it. Now, Joseph started this process last time by giving his brothers just a little taste of what they had put him through. He let them sit in prison for three days, which is nothing compared to the years in prison that Joseph endured. But again, his purpose is not vengeance. His purpose is not payback. If that were his purpose, all he has to do is lift his finger and they will be put to death or they will be in prison for the rest of their lives. That's within his power. That's not his purpose. His purpose is to awaken their consciences and to invoke empathy within them because sensitive consciences and empathy, the ability to put ourselves in our neighbor's shoes is absolutely essential to biblical love. You cannot love your neighbor as yourself And you cannot do unto your neighbor as you would have him do unto you unless you can put yourself in your neighbor's shoes. That's exactly what his brothers were not doing before, showed no capability of doing. And now he is awakening their consciences and he is invoking empathy within them. And that plan began to work immediately. If you remember in chapter 42, verse 21, when Joseph puts them in prison for three days and then brings them out, the brothers say, we are truly guilty concerning our brother, talking about Joseph. We saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us and we would not hear. Therefore, this disaster, this distress has come upon us. Their consciences are awakened. But there is still a long way to go. For the brothers remained imprisoned in guilt. It's been a long time. Joseph was 17 when they purposed to kill him. They threw him down into a pit and then they settled just for selling him into slavery. Now he is a minimum of 39 years old, 37 years old. And there a lot of years have gone by. The brothers have never dealt with their guilt. They have never dealt with their sin. They've been searing their consciences over, stuffing down the truth, stuffing down conviction for all these many years. And they still remain imprisoned by guilt. 
And their father remains imprisoned as well, but due to something else, he's imprisoned by fear. The gripping fear that something bad is going to happen to Benjamin as it did to Joseph. And that's where we ended last time with Jacob saying, you have bereaved me. He's talking to his boys. You have bereaved me. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more because uh, Joseph held Simeon and let the other boys return. Simeon is no more. Now you want to take Benjamin. All these things are against me. Now this, what we see Jacob doing, is what the Bible calls fretting. And meantime, Simeon sits in prison in Egypt, but Jacob is frozen. We see the same thing here in our text this morning. It says in verse 2, when they had eaten up the grain which they had brought from Egypt, we don't know how long it took them to do that, but it's taken some amount of time. And this entire time, Simeon is sitting in prison in Egypt, and Jacob cannot bring himself to face it or deal with it. He's not dealing with reality. And so finally, Jacob sees they're running out of grain again. He says, go back and buy us a little food. Judah, speaking for all the boys, is reminding him of reality. The man solemnly warned us, you will not even see my face unless your brother is with you. In other words, you don't get to first base, let alone you get around the bases and home if you do not bring your brother Benjamin with you. And then Jacob responds in verse 6 with more fretting. Why did you deal with me so wrongly as to tell the man whether you had still another brother? Now you see, fretting is not rational. It's an emotional reaction that fails to seek God in order to deal with the real world. Fretting is an emotional reaction It's a reaction of complaining that's born of unbelief. It's basically an emotional reaction that just wants to pull the covers up over your head so you don't have to face reality. You just want to run away. You want to escape. Fretting, in a nutshell, is the opposite of prayer. Prayer is born of faith. It's turning to God who governs reality in order to deal with reality. Fretting is the opposite of prayer. Fretting is the response of unbelief, wants to escape from reality, just push it away. And it is the natural response of fallen men, even for those who have been redeemed. This is why the Bible tells believers like us repeatedly not to fret. Because it remains a natural impulse for us as fallen and redeemed sinners. Look at Psalm 37. Now this is a psalm of David, but it's written at the very end of his life. A lot of his psalms were written earlier as he was running from Saul Saul and so forth. This is written at the end of his life when he's up on a mountaintop, as it were, looking back over the whole scope of his life and God working with him and all the things God has taught him. So this is fine wine of wisdom here in Psalm 37. These are hand-picked, the best grapes that have been aged for a long time. What is the first thing that David says to the believers of his day and of ours? Do not fret. Do not fret because of evildoers nor be envious of the workers of iniquity. Don't want to be like them, and also don't be resentful and all angry and worked up because of them. What should we do instead? Verse 3, trust in the Lord and do good. Trust in the Lord and be faithful. Trust in the Lord and be about what he tells you to be about. Verse 7, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Rest and wait to us sound like passive words. They're not passive in the Bible. Rest is an active word. Wait is an active word because these are born of faith. These are born of prayer. These are born of hope in God and in his promises. 
Look at the latter part of verse 7. Do not fret. Here we hear it again. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Do we have any of that today? Do we have any men who are bringing wicked schemes to pass and who are prospering in their way? Yes, we do. David did too. They had the same thing back then. Do not fret, it says. Verse 8, again, do not fret. It only causes harm. It doesn't do anything. It causes harm within you. It causes harm in all who hear it, and it doesn't accomplish anything. It is the opposite of prayer. And so we need to be aware of this. This is a major temptation for us, a tendency. You don't have to try to do it. You will just find yourself doing it. But we have to be aware. So when we start fretting, and you can fret anywhere. You can fret in the car. You can fret any, anywhere. We need to catch ourselves. And we need to say, I know what that is. I know what you're doing, self. You're fretting. That's what you're doing. You're complaining. You're fretting. This is the response of unbelief. Stop immediately. Start praying. Now you're doing something about it. Now you're actually facing reality. Now you're going to God who controls reality. That's born of faith. That does good. You're talking to the one who controls all things. We have to stop our fretting and start praying. And then he gives us the ultimate promise in verse 9. Evildoers shall be cut off. Now, this doesn't happen as fast as we would like to see because we want it to be instant. It's not instant. That's why we have to rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. But we have the assurance. This is what God is going to do in history. The evildoers are going to be cut off, and those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. This is not a salvage operation. It's not a Dunkirk. It's not an evacuation. That's not the way salvation is. Who is left to inherit the earth? The righteous, those who wait on the Lord. Verse 11, the meek shall inherit the earth. Who are the meek? Those who wait on the Lord, those who live by faith. Meek rhymes with weak, but the two have nothing to do with one another. Meek was a word in the ancient days that was often used of, of battle horses. A meek horse was a battle horse, a big horse, a strong horse, a mighty horse fit for battle who was completely attuned to its rider. So the slightest movement or indication of the, lighter, of the rider would cause the horse to instantly do exactly what the warrior on their back wanted them to do. That's what meekness means. It means really strong and very yielded. Really strong and very obedient. That is a meek horse. And just to show you how important and how applicable this psalm is, uh, is to us still today, this is the psalm Jesus is quoting in the Beatitudes when he says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Matthew 5, 5. The meek win in history and in eternity. The meek win on the earth and in heaven because Jesus wins in history and in eternity on the earth and in heaven. He wins flat out. History is not a stalemate between Jesus and the Bible. And then finally Jesus knocks the chessboard into the air and runs off to heaven and grabs who he can grab and goes and then scraps everything else. That's a stalemate in history and some kind of a moral victory in heaven. That's not how Jesus wins. Jesus just wins. He wins. In the end, there's nothing that Satan, sin, and death hold. So coming back to our text in Genesis 43, Jacob is fretting. He's frozen by fear. He's not responding by faith to reality. He's pulling the covers over his head, and he's complaining. And it's in this context that two of the brothers appeal to Jacob to let them take Benjamin with them to Egypt to get more food. Reuben, the firstborn, appeals to Jacob. That happened back in chapter 42. But if you remember, his appeal is bizarre and ineffectual 
because he shifts the failure to his sons. Chapter 42, verse 37. Kill my two sons if I do not bring Benjamin back to you. Stated differently, if something bad happens to Benjamin, you can console yourself by killing two of your grandsons. Now, either that appeal is not serious or the one who made it has a screw loose. Either way, you're not going to take such a proposition seriously. Neither does Jacob. He remains frozen in fear. But then in our text today, Judah appeals to him and is effective in the providence of God. God is the, the real difference, but we do see some differences in Judah's appeal to his father. First of all, it's well-reasoned. And second of all, he places the consequences of failure not upon his sons or somebody else, but 100% on himself. Verse 8, send the lad with me and we will arise and go that we may live. He's reminding Jacob that we don't really have a choice here, that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. <clears throat> and then he says, I myself will be surety for him. From my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. And then he gives him an encouraging note. If we had not lingered, surely by now we would have returned this second time. We'd already be back. You would have Benjamin back and you would have food. Now we begin to see Jacob in response to this. Jacob, whom God changed his name to Israel, we begin to see the first time in a long while Jacob began to live up to the name Israel because Israel means God's wrestler. And God gave it to Jacob because he had wrestled with God and man had prevailed. You remember he had a stranger show up in the camp uh, and, and begin to fight with him, begin to wrestle with him. And Jacob is wrestling with this guy all night long. And as the night wears on, Jacob begins to figure out this is no man. This is God himself personified this was the pre-incarnate lord jesus christ is there wrestling with jacob jacob cannot hope to prevail in this wrestling match uh, he, god simply touches his hip his hip goes out of joy but the thing is is jacob will not let go he will not give up now one of the things that god tells us he wants from us most he does this in the book of Deuteronomy. What do I really want from you, God says to his people? I want you to love me. I want you to keep my commandments. And one of the things he will say is, I want you to cling to me. In Jeremiah, he says, as a sash clings to the waist of a man, I want you to cling to me. Now, cling a lot of times to us today sounds uh, weak it sounds uh, it's something that's not desirable somebody's clingy they're needy and that kind of thing that's not what it means in the bible what it means in the bible is what jacob did all night long his hips out of joys he will not let go he will not give up he he says to god i will not let you go unless you bless me that's the attitude that's exactly what god wants from us that's Jacob, the wrestler. And so for now, for the first time in a long time, we see the old wrestler emerge. Because starting in verse 11, we see Jacob all of a sudden, instead of pulling covers over his head, he's facing reality. Verses 11 and 13. If it must be so, take your brother and arise and go again to the man. The second thing we see him doing is actively strategizing in wisdom. Verses 11 and 12. Do this. Take some of the choice fruits of the land in your bags. Carry a present down to the man. A little balm, a little honey, gum, myrrh, pistachio nuts, almonds. And take double money with you. 
And third, carry back with you all the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. We don't know what's behind that. Perhaps it was an oversight. We see him now engaging, thinking of every possible angle, and he is putting his boys in the best possible position to be able to succeed, and finally, he seeks God's blessing. He's not fretting anymore. Verse 14, may God Almighty give you mercy before the man that he may release your other brother and Benjamin. For the first time, he's thinking about Simeon too. So Jacob, by God's grace, gets his head out of the sand and back in the fight, back in real life where all God's children must live and where they encounter all sorts of hardships, but all in God's providence whose intent as our Father is to lovingly bring us to stand up to our full height and be all that God created and redeemed us to be. Trials and hardships are like special forces training. They are not fun, but they are good. In fact, in Hebrews 12, it says that no training seems pleasant for the moment. If it's fun, it's not training. If you're in Navy SEAL training and it's fun, it's not training. If it's training, it's not fun, but it is good. And there are a lot more good, these trials, if by faith we see them for what they are, and we walk through them by faith, trusting and obeying God as we go. That's what we see Jacob coming back to for the first time in a long time. Again, J uh, uh, Joseph is 17 when he gets sold. Jacob has been in this funk from 17 to now uh, Joseph being about 37 to 39 years old. That's a long time. So Jacob now is acting consistent with David's words in Psalm 37. Not fretting anymore. He's trusting in the Lord and doing good. And we also see Judah turning in the right direction because as we've noted before, God has built into Judah natural leadership qualities. He's a natural leader, but that doesn't mean he's good. We've seen him be a natural leader for evil. Previously, the whole episode with Tamar, God killed Judah's oldest two sons because of their wickedness. That's, that's all that strength and leadership ability being used for evil. Now we begin to see a little hint of Judah actually using it for something good. So the brothers, including Benjamin, go back to Egypt. When Joseph sees Benjamin with his brothers, he has everyone brought to his house for a feast. But the brothers are afraid it's a trap. It's because of the money that was returned in our sacks for the first time. We're brought here that he can make a case against us and seize us and take us as slaves. You see, their consciences have been awakened, but they still haven't dealt with their sin and their guilt before God. And so their consciences are overactive toward the negative. Anything they don't understand, they assume is a bad omen, indicating they're about to get punished for their sins. And you see, to not be right with God is to be wrong on everything because you can't see anything rightly if you're not right with God. But the lesson that God is teaching them here through Joseph is there is no running from God. You may be running, but you're not going anywhere. You can't, there's no running from God. He knows all. He rules all. And that's the same message that comes through when Joseph seats all 11 brothers according to their birth order. A lot of these boys, because uh, uh, most of them came from three different moms, were born all at the same time. So their birth order is really tight in a lot of cases. And how, how can it be that this stranger can set all 11 of them according to their exact birth order? That's astonishing to them. But what's the message that keeps coming through? There's no running from God. You can't run from God. He knows all. He rules all. And it's important to remember that even though Joseph is God's instrument here, it's not easy for him. 
Back in chapter 41, verse 51, it told of how God's blessing was making Joseph forget all the sufferings he'd been through. God brings him out of prison. God exalts him. He's married. He has sons. Everything's going well. He's beginning to forget all of the the tough things he went through. But then seeing his brothers again in verse 42, hearing them talk in Hebrew when they think he can't understand them, but they're talking about what they did to him and how they were wrong and how God is beginning to discipline them. And, and he hears that he's got another brother now from his mother who is now dead. He will never see again. Now all these memories are flooding back for Joseph and they're overwhelming him with emotion. And so for the second time, we hear that Joseph has to leave and compose himself just to get himself in a position that he can continue on. And so when Joseph comes back, he gives each of his brothers really more food than he can eat. It doesn't say that straight out, but that's implied in, in, in the text here. He, he, this is a lavish feast, and everyone has more than they could possibly eat, but Benjamin gets five times more than he could possibly eat. What's the point of that? Nobody's going to eat all that's set in front of him. Why does he need five times as much? Because again, Joseph and the providence of God is now forcing the brothers into his shoes from before. Once again, once again, the brothers are faced with a younger brother, this time Benjamin, apparently the only son of Rachel, once again, who receives more blessing than they do. It's not that they've been cut short, they've got more than they could deal with, but he's got five times as much. You see Joseph putting them in the same situation again. The point is, what are you going to do this time? Are you going to kill Benjamin on the way back? Are you going to sell him into slavery? What are you going to do this time? Have you learned anything? And so we see God working through Joseph, big picture, forcing the brothers to choose between two ways of living. The first way of living is to continue on living the way that they have been, where each one's central focus is himself, and his chief desire is serving himself, grabbing as much as he can for himself in competition with others. This is exactly what we've seen with the brothers. What have we seen? Well, we've seen Reuben sleep with his father's wife, Billa. We've seen Simeon and Levi use the covenant sign that God ordained of circumcision as a ruse so they can slaughter all the men of the town of Salem as a result of which every single wife in Salem is now rendered a widow and every single child is rendered fatherless. And then they get all the other older brothers there to help them plunder the town. We see when God calls Jacob, go back to Bethel and worship me there, Jacob's got to say, okay, perhaps we should leave all the idols uh, here And then all the boys have to come out with his idols and they leave these huge pile of idols. These boys have not been walking with the Lord in a long time. And so when your focus, your central focus is yourself and your chief desire is serving yourself, you you inevitably end up looking at life like it's a pie with only so much to go around. And so for somebody else to get a bigger piece means you have to get a smaller piece. And if you want a bigger piece for yourself, somebody else is going to have to get a smaller piece. And therefore, you end up constantly comparing yourself to other people. That's what the brothers have been doing, which turns life into a roller coaster. You're constantly going up and down. You're either feeling good about yourself because you feel like you have more blessing and less hardship than somebody else, 
And so you feel good about yourself, and then you end up looking down on the other person. Or you end up feeling bad about yourself because the other person seems to have more blessing and less hardship than you. And then that makes you look on the other person with anger and envy and hostility and resentment. It says straight out that when the brothers uh, captured Joseph and they were going to kill him and then sold him into slavery, it was because of envy. It's because they're comparing. When the situation really was, as we looked into the details, Joseph was the only one of the boys that Jacob could actually trust. Trust to tell the truth. Trust to know and do the right thing. He was the only one. So that's, they can continue on living that way. That's the first way. The second way of living, and the only real alternative to the first, is to begin living like Joseph has been. Because we've seen Joseph put into every one horrible situation after another, pressed down as low as you can go, circumstances as hopeless as they can possibly be, and yet we've seen Joseph through all remain faithful, remain gracious, and, and keep serving God and serving whoever God puts over him in such a way that the people constantly conclude this is not normal. God is with this young man. That's what they conclude. So Joseph, his central focus is not himself. His central focus is God. His chief desire is not serving himself. His chief desire is walking with God, serving him, and receiving his blessing. Even when that blessing seems to be running away from him for many years. Joseph doesn't view life like a finite pie with only so much to go around. He views life as a bottomless treasure chest because God is the infinite God. He has infinite blessings to give. So somebody else being blessed more does not mean less for Joseph. Them being blessed more means more for Joseph. More for others means more for us because God is the infinite God of infinite blessings. Joseph's not comparing himself to others. He doesn't feel superior if he appears to have more blessing at the moment, nor does he feel angry and envious if another appears to have more blessing at the moment. So Joseph accepts blessings. He also accepts hardships because they knows they're not random. They're tailor-made. They're tailor-made by God to train him up in specific to reflect God's own character and to share in his work, his kingdom, his joy, and his glory. That's what God's doing. Joseph gets it. And that's why he's the way he is. As we conclude, we need to realize these are the same two choices for us as well. The only way to keep your heart from burning up with anger and envy and to be on this roller coaster ride up and down, up and down, feeling superior and arrogant or feeling down and being angry and envy, is to have your heart heated up with love and zeal for God. It's really interesting because in the Bible, both in the Old Testament in the Hebrew and in the New Testament in the Greek, the, the word that's used for envy and anger and resentment on the one hand and zeal for the Lord or love for the Lord on the other, it's the same word. It means to be heated up. It means for your heart to be heated up. And so it's assumed your heart is going to be heated up by something. The question is what? If you're comparing yourself to others all the time, you're your central focus, serving yourself is central then your heart is going to be heated up by bad fuel. Bad fuel that makes all kinds of noxious fumes and creates all kinds of soot and tar to gum up your heart. That's what's going to be heating your heart. The only alternative to that is to have your heart heated up out of love and zeal for God. In Genesis 37, it says Joseph's brother's envied him. It's the Hebrew word kana. And so they go, because they envied him, they say, let's kill him. 
In Zechariah 8, verse 2, it says, I am zealous for Zion. Kala, same word. I'm zealous for Zion. I'm heated up by a great zeal for God's people, God's church. New Testament, same thing. James 3, verse 16, where envy, zealous, be heated up, where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. James 4, 2, you covet, same word, zealous, you're heated up out of envy and coveting, and you can't obtain, so you fight and you war. It's the same word as is used of Jesus in John 2, verse 17, zeal, zealous, for your house has eaten me up. And listen to the way Jesus speaks to the church in Revelation 3, verse 15. He tells the church, this particular church, you're neither cold nor hot. Zestos, that's related to the word zelos. You're not hot. That's the problem. You're lukewarm. I will vomit you out of my mouth. What's the answer? Verse 19, be zealous, zelos, be hot, heat it up, and repent. In other words, you, your heart is going to be heated up by something. The question is what? And the only way to not be heated up by envy, by anger, by all of these unrighteous things, which then just creates all kinds of pollution in your heart, is to have it heated up with the clean, the clean fuel of love and zeal for God himself, for his people, for his kingdom. It's the attitude we see in Psalm 73, verse 23. It says to God, you hold me by my right hand. Here, this is reality. This is the truth. This is what should heat you up. You will guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth I desire beside you. That's the heart of Joseph right there. That's the heart every single Christian is called to have. So something is heating your heart, Christian. What is it? What's heating your heart? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.